The cocktail, the cocktail bar, the cocktail bartender. This is an American story, and it begins at the turn of the 18th to the 19th century. In colonial times, we were a rum-drinking country, and that sort of came to an end with the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 because, frankly, we couldn't get any molasses in this country. So we started making more grain spirits, American grain spirits, and that led right into the story of the cocktail. The first definition of the cocktail in 1806, it was just a novelty. Strong spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters. And bitters, bitters being the key ingredient that separated this one category of mixed alcoholic beverage from all the others that came before, the slings, the punches that we've already talked about. Bitters, a new product developing from the 18th to the 19th century. And adding bitters to that single, that single ingredient created this new, co this new cocktail category. By the end of the 19th century, we all know that every mixed drink was referred to as a cocktail. And guess what? By the end of the 20th century, pretty much every mixed drink was referred to as a martini. That's another story for another time. But let me go back. Let me go back to the beginning. Um, it's a post-industrial beverage. Why? Because we needed technology. In 1806, it was a novelty. The one thing missing from the definition, strong spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters, is ice. Ice is the heart and the soul of the cocktail. But ice, as Mark Twain said, in the early part of the 19th century was like jewels, only for the very wealthy. It was very hard to get ice. But as technology, as the Industrial Revolution was exported to the United States and we became an industrial nation up in that Northeast Corridor, big changes happened. Uh, the technology of saturation machines to add gas to water and then flavor it. The technology of gas to push beer through lines. The technology of artificial ice machines. These technological, the most important technology, the column still, becoming in wide use by the end of the middle to the end of the 19th century. These things fed right into the whole cocktail revolution that happened in America. Immigration was a huge part of it. We had a big wave of immigration in the 1730s. That's where we got the Scotsmen and the Irishmen who fought our, our Revolutionary War very, very bravely. And those guys who were taxed by Alexander Hamilton and left the country in the early part of the of the. 19th century because they wanted to be left alone to make their spirits. That's what they did. And so they went to the new frontier, Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois. Guess what they did out there? Right. They made grain spirits. Those grain spirits had no market, though. They sold to the Indians. They floated down the river to New Orleans, and they sold them to the French, who drank brandy and could care less. But the Industrial Revolution brought us the steam engine, which they strapped to the back of those flatboats, went up those rivers to the Erie Canal and across to the big markets in the Northeast. Then whiskey became an important part of the cocktail revolution. So we have technology. We have immigration. Immigration plays a big role in the middle of the 19th century. In 1840, we got 200,000 people coming from the British Islands to America. In 1850, we have 2 million because there's a terrible crop failure in Ireland, and we have one-third of the population dies. Uh, Europe is a mess from the Napoleonic Wars. So we have immigration coming from all over Eastern Europe, Germany, Poland, everywhere. These two groups of immigrants brought something really, really important with them, communal drinking habits. The beer halls of Eastern Europe and Germany, the, the pubs and taverns of Ireland. And England. guess what they did in their ghettos in the big industrial cities of the Northeast Quarter of the United States? They continued that tradition in their illegal social clubs. And here is where we get the third piece of the puzzle, politics. Tammany Hall ran all the big political machines in the Northeast in those days, in the middle of the 19th century. Tammany Hall, the, the party of Thomas Jefferson, the party of the people. What did they do? They went into these ghettos, and they said, ah, you've got these illegal social, club fellas, fel got these illegal social clubs, fellas. Let's take these clubs and make them legal. I got some friends in the beer business who would love to back you guys in something. Well, how about you, O'Malley? Put you over here and you put your cousin down on the other corner, and guess what they did? From 1850 to 1880, they installed saloons all over the cities in the Northeast. Why would they do this? Well, who hung around in saloons in those days? Men. Women didn't go into saloons, at least not proper women. So if you open a bunch of saloons where men hang out, what can men do that women can't do? They can vote. So what you have here are a bunch of political action centers that you just opened for your party. And that's what started this whole thing rolling. By the 1880s, however, there were so many saloons. Hey, listen, I came to New York City 1969. There were still five saloons in every block on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Five, no less. Now, because of real estate, it's diminished a little bit. Those saloons went back to the 1880s, back to this period. We have all these saloons. Competition becomes product, quality, 
these things start to become really, really important. 1862, we talked about Jerry Thomas's famous book, How to Mix Drinks. Finally, we're starting to record these recipes. Products are coming on the market. We had that period of laissez-faire between the, the early part of the 19th century and the Civil War when, when basically al alcoholic beverages were untaxed, and so they it grew uh, laissez-faire. Uh, so we have new products coming on the market. We have competition. By 1880, we have a serious profession developed, the white jacketed bartender with his diamond stick pin, a leader in the community, a true craftsman who manufactures many of his own products. He makes his own bitters, his own syrups, his own cordials. Really an important part of the profession was the, what happened in the morning before you opened the doors of the saloons when they manufactured a lot of their own products. So this was the golden age. This is where the, Mar Mar the martini didn't come from prohibition. The Manhattan didn't come from prohibition. They came from this period, 1880. The Manhattan, the martini, the sour, the fizz, the julep, a much older beverage, which was perfected at this time as a whiskey instead of a brandy drink. This was the golden age of the cocktail. Sadly, by the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, the 20th century, what a disaster for food and beverage in this country. We started the 20th century with a world war, followed by the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl followed by another world war. Uh, you know, during these world wars, we figured out how to process and can and powder food so we could send it overseas to the boys. And what did we do after these wars were over in the 50s? We, we embraced this technology in our commercial food production facilities, and we started selling all this processed food. I mean, you went to a grocery store, the thing that developed after the Second World War, where you bought your food. If you walked into a grocery store, half of the stuff doesn't even look like food. We lost our way on the culinary and beverage side in these years. We call it the age of the bland. Even our children, we were giving breast, we were giving canned milk instead of breast milk. We had really lost our way. A big thing happened in 1959. Here in New York City, a man named Joseph Baum, not well known out of the industry, but within the industry considered to be one of the geniuses who took us forward in food and beverage, the Four Seasons and La Fonda del Sol. The Four Seasons in the beautiful Seagram's building, a groundbreaking architectural feat of the day, Mies van der Rohe, Philip Johnson, Lake Cabossier, the major architects on this beautiful building. Edgar Bronfman Sr. wants to put a Cadillac dealership on the ground floor, and Joe Baum talked him out of it. He said, what you need is a world-class restaurant. He opens the Four Seasons, a seasonally changing menu of local, regional, real food, recipes from around the world. It was unheard of. And he inspires young people with, this restaurant is still open in the Seagram's building today. That's a tribute in a business where longevity is rare. He inspires people like Alice Waters on the West Coast, Larry Forgione on the East Coast. He mentors Kevin Zraeli, who puts wine back on the table in America by taking the snobbery out of the sales of wine and trying to actually sell wine to people. He changes the way the Americans eat and drink over a period of 30 years. What's all this got to do with the cocktail? Well, the cocktail was really on the rocks during these years, if you'll excuse the expression, and so was the bartending profession. You've heard how we came out of prohibition with no professionals in the bartending industry. The profession itself damaged by prohibition. Who wants to send their young son and daughter to be a bartender when gangsters ran the bars for the whole decades of prohibition? So bartending was what your uncle who couldn't get into college did. Those times are changing. Bartending now, and by the way, there were no schools then. There were no places to learn. You learned on the job and you learned a lot of mistakes. But because in this culinary revolution of the 70s and the 80s, we as an American people changed the way we eat and drink. We love big flavor. We love the extraordinary, vast choices we have when it comes to dining, all the different cuisines that are available to us. The Zagat Guide, which came out in 1979 with six ethnic cuisines listed in the back, now has 96 listed in the back. What an amazing feat. What happened in those intervening years? We learned how to eat. We fell in love with big flavor. Suddenly, the bar, which is way behind, still using artificial mixes. People walk up to the bar who have just dined on extraordinary fresh real food and they get a margarita made with some kind of green neon liquid out of a gun. They said no thank you. And that's when 
the changes began to happen. At the Rain Room in 19, Joe again mentoring me, making his, making his, uh, his, his genius known in another area, cocktails. He demanded from me a real cocktail bar. I had no idea what he was talking about. He said, get a book by Jerry Thomas. He didn't tell me it was written in 1862. I searched bookstores for the darn thing in libraries, found out finally that it had been out of print for 100 years. So I get the book, and I start to see what they did in the 19th century with all the real ingredients and fresh. It was the news to me. It was news to all of us who learned how to tend bar in the 60s and 70s because we used sour mixes, and, and we did it the easy way. So as I began to study the, the, what Joe demanded, a real bar, back there at the beginning of the Rainbow Room, and began to train my bartenders to do real drinks with real fresh ingredients, it opened a whole new door. What it did was brought people back to the bar to order cocktails, because what did we order in the intervening years? Sure, a Manhattan and a martini, they're easy to make. They don't have any fresh juices. What about sours and all those? Forget about it. People did not order those drinks because they did not taste good in those years. Now, they're starting to taste good again, and people are coming back in droves to the bar because it's fresh, it's real. And that's what this is all about. That's what this course is all about. Fresh, real, honest ingredients, just like on the culinary side.